Good morning. Welcome to Long Green. Did you all enjoy that aroma as you walked into the building this morning? No? They were getting the, the, the fields ready for all the rain today. Nobody? You didn't smell? Well, maybe it was, you had to be up early. Maybe it was being up early here. No? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, just a few quick announcements. Uh, child care, again, is available. We have a nursery through... Um, I think age three that functions through up the hallway throughout the entire service. So you're welcome to drop your kiddos off up there uh, at your convenience. And also worship time, when we dismiss worship time, worship time is just a reminder for ages four and up. Um, also, uh, there's some questions. Uh, folks were wondering how, to, how why we don't uh, do offering plates anymore. Right now we're still doing the boxes at the back and at the front. Just a quick reminder about that. Um, also, we do have a quick announcement. Uh, today is Lord's Supper Sunday, uh, so the elements are at the back and at the front. And one of our VBS teachers has requested that you don't throw out the little plastic container. Uh, please drop it in this Amazon Prime box up here on the front row. Uh, she'll, she'll use those, oh, the, the magical things that they make with stuff that we throw out for VBS. So. Um, just also a quick reminder, we're also collecting um, a pack of backpack uh, school supply drives. It's also uh, for VBS this week. Any other quick announcements that somebody might have? Yes, Marion. Um, we need rocks, right? We need the rocks is rocks. what we're making. No. <laughs> so I'm glad nobody on the internet heard that. <laughs> so uh, Miss Marion would like to fill my office with bags of rocks. Um, so, but uh, yeah, I, I know, I know, I had to repeat it. So, um, so we'll we won't fill my office. We'll fill the open office, the empty office. That was a good one to do. So uh, please, if you don't mind helping out Marion with those, um, we'll get those together. Thank you for joining us today. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer and begin our service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. I thank you for the day that you've given us. Lord, we're thankful that we can come and worship uh, with one another, or that we can worship you. Lord, we come and we sing our songs of praise to you. Lord, I pray that it would be a fragrant aroma uh, in the throne room this morning. Lord, I pray that you would bless this time in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together.
song is our cry this morning. We just come here this morning to gather together, to take time out of our week, to declare your goodness uh, to one another, to the world, to just rejoice for, Lord, what you've done in our lives, how we've seen you work, how you've begun ever so slowly to change us into your image. So, Lord, as we go through the rest of our service this morning, as we uh, sing songs as we hear your word, as we teach our children. We just pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This next song is a new one for us. So you can sit and listen. You can stand and sing. If you know it, you better sing it. So let's do this together. <laughs> Never enough 
big thank you to the uh, worship team. Uh, it's one of my favorite uh, songs right now. Thank you. I'll let Bob make his way out of here. All right, kids are dismissed for worship time. Uh, four, ages four and up. You okay, Bob? There we go. If you haven't done so, um, again, I do provide notes in the bulletin. Uh, it's on a green page there for you. You can grab those. Hopefully somebody was at the doors to uh, pass them out to you. Um, if not, I'm sure Jerry wouldn't mind running around and uh, delivering them by hand. Um, I don't... We're going to go ahead and keep going through our study in Acts. Um, last time we were together, we looked at how um, Paul and Silas had completely upset the world uh, and were kind of chased uh, out of Thessalonica. This Jewish mob ran them out of the, th the city of Thessalonica. They'd upset their world, so they forced them to leave. And Paul and Silas' next stop, I have a map here, hopefully my clicker connects, um, of kind of their route that they took. They kind of snaked up uh, above the Aegean Sea and uh, down in towards Athens is where we'll end up this week. When they arrived, once again, Paul did what he typically did, and he went to the synagogue. And he used the Old Testament scriptures to help them understand the good news of Jesus' coming. And these Bereans were wonderful because they had already accepted the scripture and the scriptures as absolute authoritative truth. So it made it all the more easy for Paul as they shared Jesus, the Messiah. And this example should remind us as well this morning. Some of you may know Jesus as your Savior, some may not. But my prayer, and as we pray to begin our, our uh, study this morning, uh, my prayer is that if you have not met Jesus as your Savior, that that would be something that you meet Him this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we see Paul and Silas work their way through to the cultural hub of Athens, Lord, I pray that um, our heart would be Paul's heart. Lord, as we see within our fallen and, and broken culture, as we see things that you come and you mend and you make whole, Lord, may we have the Spirit-led wisdom to point people to truth. Lord, may that be our desire, our hope, and Lord, our goal on a weekly basis. In your name we pray. Amen. So will this mindset of the people of Berea was something unique to them. And their example should also remind us. As I said a couple weeks ago, the Bible is our supreme source and authority for life. It's our compass, our guide, not experiences, not our feelings or what we want. The Bible is our compass. After all, this book is not the word of man. It's the written word of God. As Proverbs 30 verse 5 says that every word of God is flawless. Well, with this mindset, things were, of course, going great in the city of Berea, which is on the side there of the Aegean Sea, until, again, a crowd followed Paul and Silas to this new town. The same Jews who had opposed Paul and Silas in Thessalonica showed up. It's so funny seeing throughout Acts, this mob just must have followed them wherever they went. And they'd followed him quickly, uh, and they began to stir up a new lynch mob now in Berea, similar to the one in Thessalonica that had chased Paul and forced Paul to leave uh, his third church. They all promised, uh, and he would event eventually leave 
Paul would leave uh, Luke and Timothy uh, there, and uh, Luke and Timothy had joined them again in Berea. They were able to stay with Silas and shepherd this little third baby church in Berea. Um, They all promised to join him in Athens as soon as possible. Once Paul arrived at this large city, he got settled in. And I think he probably did what a lot of us, too, would do uh, with a city that we're visiting. He would go out and see a tour and take a tour of this world-famous city. And I'm sure that even then that tourism was huge in Athens because it was a city that uh, was unsurpassed in sculpture and architecture. It boasted about 60, a 60,000 seat stadium. Art galleries uh, existed in rare abundance. And Athens, though it had, was a little bit past its prime or her glory days at the time, but it still stood as the cultural centerpiece of the entire Greek world. It was lavishly decorated music halls, respected academies, uh, lined the stone-laid streets. Wealthy families from around the world would still send their children to Athens to study. After all, this was a university city. It was famous for the way it embraced its higher learning. They'd been the home of Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato. I'm sure Paul took all this in. He enjoyed the atmosphere of learning. And I say this because he himself had been trained in in one of these prestigious universities in a city of that day named Tarsus. I think it's obvious that his education in Tarsus included Greek poetry. Because as you'll see, as we get into our passage in a moment, he quoted two of their uh, poets in his sermon to the Areopagus. I'm sure Paul was thrilled by the mind-challenging educational atmosphere of Athens. But soon his excitement would turn to sorrow. As he saw much idol worship around the city. It's been repeatedly said that it was easier to find a god than a man in Athens. And it's easy to understand how someone could make this statement because there were tens of thousands of them in Paul's day. More idols in Athens than in all the rest of Greece combined. R.C.H. Lenski says that because of this, Athens was one great altar, one great offering to the gods. Well, the more idols that Paul would see on his sightseeing tour, the more upset he became. As verse 16 puts it, Paul was distressed in spirit because of the prevalence of all these little g gods, gods of stone, of wood, of clay, marble, and gold. He was distressed because these idols showed him that the men and women of Athens were seeking. They had the full capacity of religion, of understanding religion, but they were seeking it in all the wrong places. Each idol also revealed a twisting, a distorting of the capacity and a sabotage of the ability to worship. The enemy was obviously at full work throughout the city of Athens. And as Paul took all the sights in, God began to plant in this preacher an outline of a sermon in his heart. During his walks through the city, God helped him see exactly what these people, the people of Athens, needed to hear. And Paul practiced that first draft of his message, I'm sure, by sharing a conviction with the synagogue. And then further, he honed it by literally taking this message out to the street, discussing his views with the Athenians in the marketplace. And it may, might seem odd to us that Paul, this newcomer in this city, a stranger, would discuss the things in his mind with the people in the marketplace. But here we see in verse 21 of our passage, 
that in Athens, that is what people did for fun. Look, look at verse 21. We see, now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. These Greeks loved to discuss things. So Paul's street corner sermons were welcome. Well, through one of these street interviews, Paul met representatives of the two main philosophical groups of that city. First, the Epicureans, and secondly, the Stoics. The Epicureans believed that the chief end of man was pleasure and the avoidance of pain. They didn't deny the existence of gods, but taught that God did not involve himself in the affairs of man. They also believed that at death, the body and soul just dissolved and went away. They didn't believe in the afterlife. This was the eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die crowd. Because they believed if it feels good, do it. If it feels bad, don't do it. I don't know about you, but I think the Epicurean philosophy is still alive and kicking today in our pleasure-worshipping and pain-avoiding culture. So this is the first group that he met, the Epicureans. The next uh, other group was, again, once my clicker catches up, the Stoics. These Stoics were pantheists. They taught, they taught that everything is God. The stones, the trees, the birds, you, me, everything. In many ways, they were complete opposites of the Epicureans because they were fatalists. They were fatalists who believed that since life is filled with unavoidable good and bad, the best we can do is to grin and bear it. They prided themselves on their ability to take whatever came. They urged moderation in life and regarded apathy as the highest virtue. We need to think of it this way. The Epicurean said, enjoy life. While the Stoics said, endure life. So try to imagine these two proud groups who are so set in their ways in the marketplace, listening to this newcomer Paul talk. Picture these eggheads. You got these guys, they're, they're brainiacs. They, they, are just, they live to argue with one another. I don't know about you, but I'm not. That's not how I'm wired. Um, so, some, of, some of us are wired this way and just love the, 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 the philosophical confrontation that takes place. Luke tells us that after listening a bit, some of them shook their heads and called Paul. Pretty interesting term here. In some of your, tra uh, in some of your translations, the term is translated babbler, a babbler. But if we actually look at what the, the Greek says here, it's actually kind of more like a seed picker. They called him a seed picker. And what it refers to is it refers to those scavenger birds or even chickens, if any of you have chickens in your backyard. The chickens are constantly going around pecking, looking for seed and food scraps that had fallen on the streets, in your yard or in the market. Think of them as those little winged, oh boy, I can't get, think of those, those winged birds, scavengers who devour any leftover fries that they find in the parking lot this is actually a picture of Ocean City, New Jersey. The, the, these scavengers have gotten so bad, they brought in hawks and owls to, to scare them away. So think of them as those little winged scavengers who devour any leftover fries that you've left or dropped out of your car in the parking lot at McDonald's. You have the right idea when you think of that because this designation meant that these guys thought of Paul as a mere collector of fragments of truth. Someone who was not really educated, but had found a few morsels of truth. 
The kind of thought of Paul that he was a few uh, fries short of a happy meal. (laughs) But others thought it would be interesting to hear what Paul had to say. Since to them he seemed to be spouting some new truth that they hadn't heard. And as I said, these Greeks just loved to debate, to discuss any new truth that might be out there. So, of course, they would talk amongst themselves, and they decided to give him a formal hearing in front of the Areopagus, a council in Athens that had the responsibility for supervising the entire education of that city and controlling the many itinerant lecturers who would go about and, and passing through. Paul accepted their invitation, and I'm sure he thought it was a great opportunity. Kind of like being asked to preach before the U.S. Senate, being asked to preach before the president and his entire cabinet. As one who frequently prepares sermons, I must say that Paul had a great introduction to the sermon that he was preparing because it enabled him to identify with the listeners, to identify with his listeners in such a way that he seized immediately their attention. Look at verses 22 through 23. I hope you see what I mean here. So Paul, standing in the midst of this Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. In his opening words, he didn't put them down. He didn't attack them. He didn't attack their idolatry. In fact, he sort of paid them a compliment by saying, I've walked around your beautiful city, and it's obvious to me that you are very religious people. I see that you are God-fearers. He went on to comment in his sight about town that he discovered an altar made to the unknown God, one of several such idols all throughout Athens. As I prepared for this sermon... I came across this really interesting story that I was not aware of prior. I came across a story behind the origin of these altars, these idols, um, and I found it very interesting. It seemed that many centuries before Paul arrived or set foot in Athens, a great plague, pestilence, had broken out in Athens. And these God-fearing people decided to deal with the plague And how they decided to deal with best with the plague was to turn a flock of sheep loose in the city. They let them run wild for a while. And then they went to take a look and follow them. Wherever a sheep laid down, they were slain. They were offered to a god that was closest to it. If they were slain near the altar of a recognized god, they were dedicated it to that god, to Zeus, Athena, or whoever. But if they were found in a place that there there was not an idol nearby, a new altar was erected at that spot, and the lamb was sacrificed there to an unknown god. Well, these idols gave Paul a wonderful God-breathed, spirit-led idea in his introduction So he says to them, this is the God that I want to talk to you about. I want to tell you about this unknown God. And as I said, this introduction really got their attention. And then with all these educated brainiacs, the Stoics, and the Epicureans, ears perked up, he began to preach a short but very powerful message. It's recorded for us in verses 24 through 34. Follow along in your scriptures or on the screen as you can. Verse 24 says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, 
nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Verse 26, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place. Verse 27, That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Verse 30, the times of ignorance, uh, the times of ignorance God overlooked but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Verse 31, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. I don't want us to miss this in Paul's sermon because I think it contains truth that we need to hear today. It won't take long. You might wonder how much time I have left here, but it won't take long. It's a brief message, and it can be wrapped up in one powerful point. And it's this. Paul says, listen, your unknown God, your unknown God has made himself known. And he's made himself known in three specific ways. And we're going to look at those three ways this morning. First, the unknown God makes himself known in creation. As Paul puts it in verse 24, evidence of his power and wisdom can be seen no matter which direction these Athenians would look. No matter which direction they looked because the unknown God made the world and everything in it. God is unlike their gods of stone and clay and marble because he was not created by man. In fact, as the originator, designer, creator of all things, he made the stone, he made the wood, he made the precious metals that those Greeks had used to make all of their 10,000 gods and the temples that would house them. Paul went on to say that unlike the Greek gods, the unknown God did not need their sacrifices. No real God would. To need anything would make that being less than a God. And Paul was right. God doesn't need our gifts. He gives us our needs. Our very life and our breath, everything comes and is sustained by God. He's our sustainer, not the other way around. So I have to ask, does this part of Paul's sermon need to be preached today? Of course it does. Like those Epicureans and those Stoics, those know-it-alls, most of the movers and shakers in our culture are still either don't believe in God or they embrace a warped understanding of him. Many have accepted the theories of Charles Darwin as fact. The pure form of this evolutionary theory says all of this amazing world of ours that we're surrounded by, including you, myself, they're all just accidents, part of the circle of life, that there was no creator God. This is the message that is taught throughout our culture all over our nation. So we need to hear this first point of Paul's sermon, this part of Paul's sermon to prepare us on our own or for our own Areopagus experiences where we have them. In fact, there's more evidence for a creator today than ever before. The more mankind has devalued or delved into true science during the past 2,000 years, the more facts 
they've come across that point to the existence of an intelligent and a compassionate creator. This is because, as it says in Romans 1.20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. And the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Uh, they've been, been clearly seen being understood from what he has made. We need to think of it this way. God, the creator of everything, loves visual aids. He loves to put things all around us in the created order to teach us things. As you work with kids up the hallway teaching worship time, I'm sure they're doing this right now, they're using visual aids. That's what gets kids' attention. And honestly, it's what grabs our attention as well. He loves to put things all around us in the created order to teach us things, to teach us things about himself so that when we look and when we study creation around us, we learn more about God. Hendrik von Van Loon, the journalist and a journalist and a lecturer, responded to God's visual aids in creation. Because after his first visit to the Grand Canyon, this was his, his statement. I came an atheist and I leave a believer. And more and more true scientists are following his example. You might not hear it in the public and educational services. Uh, circles, but many scientists now concede that the universe began suddenly and in a flash of light and energy. Belie they believe there was a cause, and if there was a cause, there had to be a cause-er. After looking and truly studying the stars, former agnostic, a former agnostic astrologer, uh, sorry, astronomer, Robert Jastrow, was forced to concede that although details may differ, he says, the essential element in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis is the same. The chain of events leading to man commenced suddenly and sharply at a definite moment in time in a flash of light and energy. So yes, this part of Paul's sermon is still preachable for us today. Its message still needs to be heard because the more we look at creation, the more we will be able to know about our creator God. His second point was that the unknown God makes himself known in the human heart. We see this in verse 27. It says that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. In other words, God's designed each of us with a need to know him, a hunger in our heart to find him. He built within each of us a sort of God-shaped hole, a hole in the midst of our being. I've heard of at least two recent scientific studies that confirm this. All people are each hardwired to seek God, to need God. And when we respond to this programming that's within us and seek our creator, we find him because Paul is right. God is not far from each of us. In his best-selling book, The Body, Chuck Colson recounts the true story of a girl named uh, Irina, I'm going to really butcher her last name here, but Radoshinskaya, Radoshinskaya, Irina Radishinskaya, who lived in Russia in the days before uh, the fall of the Iron Curtain, back when Nikita Khrushchev ruled the Soviet Union. One day in school, Arena looked out the window to see snow falling, and she yearned to be out of school so she and her playmates could build snowmen and have snowball fights and slid down hills. Instead of being stuck in school listening to those boring lectures. In fact, as she watched the snowfall, she was in the midst of her least favorite class, the compulsory atheist instruction. Arena had been created with a sharp mind. She noticed that in Russia, everyone seemed to be against God. The teachers, the 
headmaster, the speakers on the radio, the whole country was against God. To her, this didn't seem fair. After all, even on the playground, they were not allowed to gang up on one person. It also seemed odd to her that they all pitched such a furious battle against someone they said that didn't even exist. This didn't make sense. If God didn't exist, why go to all the trouble? God doesn't exist, the instructor said again. Only silly, ignorant old women believe in him. Irina thought, can't they tell they're giving themselves away? Adults tell you there are no gremlins or ghosts. They tell you once or twice, and that's it. But with God, they tell you over and over and over again. So he must exist. And he must be very powerful for them to fear him so greatly. With that logic in mind, she returned to thinking about the snow, and then she uttered her first attempts at a prayer. She reached out to the God who, as Paul said, isn't far from any one of us. She prayed. And her prayer, in a way, was this. God, if you do not, or did not exist, we wouldn't have to listen to this lecture. So it's your fault we are sitting here, in here, missing the snow. If you're so powerful, make it keep snowing. I think many, many of us students have had that exact same. <laughs> so. Well, the one true God, the God who created the universe and all that's in it, he answered her prayer. And white flakes fell like manna for three days the city's largest snowfall in 60 years. School was canceled, and Arena and her friends had a grand old time. Later, she felt the gently melting kisses from heaven fall on her face. Arena thought about this God her teachers denied, the one who could make snowfall from the official communist airspace. She reached out to God, the God, she knew in the depths of her heart uh, was there, and he reached back through the snow. He sent the snow, and then he guided her to places where she could read about his son. Arena eventually became a Christian and got a Bible. All this because, as Paul said in his sermon, the unknown God has made himself known in the human heart. The fact is, is that we are never alone. God has gone before us in every human encounter. He's hardwired every human being to seek after him. So when we share our faith, we're just helping them find what they were created to want. When we point to him, we're just joining God in his work. This leads us to Paul's final point, and it's found in verse 31 where he reminds the council that as he had no doubt said several times in the Athenian marketplace, verse 31 says, because he was fixed, uh, has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. His final point is that the unknown God makes himself known through his son, Jesus Christ. Paul said these tens of thousands of idols of graven images were false, but that in essence God had revealed himself in an image, one image, the image of his only son, Jesus Christ. As Paul would later write in Colossians 1.15, he says, the son Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And as in Hebrews 1.3, the author puts it, it, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Two first grade buddies were playing when one said to the other, I had a good time in vacation Bible school this morning. Why don't you go with me tomorrow? His friend responded by asking, what's a vacation Bible school? The little boy replied, we have it at church, we play games, we sing, and we learn about Jesus Christ. 
His friend asked, who is Jesus Christ? And then in wisdom, I'm sure that was surely born of the Spirit of God, the six-year-old answered, Jesus Christ is the best picture of God that has ever been took. I don't know that his English was proper, but he got it, he got it to the point. The boy was right. The clearest way that God has made himself known is through his son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus, God came down to our level so we can see his sacrificial love. Jesus was born to set the world right by dying for our sins. And he proved that he had the power to do that by rising from the dead on the third day. As Paul told his Greek audience, we will be judged someday as to how we respond to this message. If we repent of our sin and put our faith in him, we will have eternal life. If we reject so great a salvation, we will face eternity separated from God, the one true God who's made himself known in his creation, in our hearts and through his Son. So this is Paul's sermon and his hearers' feedback, their criticism of the seed picker's message came in three responses. And there's three responses that I think we can have today. The first were the mockers. Some mocked his message. Two, there were the hearers. They said that they'd like to hear him preach again on the subject another day. You know, a lot of us husband, this is, this is what I thought of my illustration here, the hearers. Like I'll be sitting and talking with my wife and I hear what she says, but I really don't listen and follow what she asks me to do. A lot of us men fall into these situations, the hearers. You hear it, but you don't apply it. And then I have to be asked again, what, what did I just tell you? It's like, wait, one or two sentences back or just the last sentence? No. But Then we have the final response, the one that I hope that all of us have here this morning, the followers. Some became Christians. We see in verse 34 some of the specifics. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. So what is your response? I pray you'll not mock Paul's sermon because it's the gospel truth. And I'd also advise you not to put off a response hoping for a future sermon to maybe be more convincing because we don't know how much future any of us really have. It's my prayer that if you are here and not a follower of Jesus Christ, that you will respond like Dionysus and Demaris and the others who decided that day to put their faith in Jesus Christ. If you're already a believer, perhaps God is leading you to join our church family, to work with us here as a church body, to do our best to turn the world right side up. And as we pray, I'm going to ask Grace to come forward as we celebrate today the Lord's Supper. We celebrate what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we pray and we prepare for this Lord's table. And as you pray about how you can respond to Paul's message, I pray that you would think through that and prepare your hearts for the Lord's table.
haven't done so, I'd encourage you to head to the back of the table. The elements are there. Verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 11 says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this table. Lord, we thank you that we can come, we can sit together, and Lord, that we can celebrate what your Son accomplished for us on the cross. Lord, we thank you that as we take this bread, Lord, we thank you for what it represents. Lord, we thank you for the body that was broken for us. Lord, may we be followers of you. Lord, may we not be just be hearers who in one ear and out the other. Lord, may we be followers of you. Verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11 says, The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's give thanks for the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what this cup represents. Lord, we thank you for the representation of Jesus' blood. As we partake of it, Lord, I thank you for the relationship that we can have with Jesus. And Lord, that each of us who stands and who follows you, Lord, that that blood was spilled purposely for us. We thank you for that this morning. Verse, 20, uh, verse 23 uh, says that, or 25 says this. In the same way, after uh, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the news of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if you'll stand with me now, we'll celebrate with one final song.
Father, we come before you, Lord, we celebrate because of what you've accomplished in our lives. Lord, I pray that we would go with that message of hope that only you can save, and Lord, that you've saved us, and Lord, I pray that we would be your hands and feet wherever we go, in your name we pray, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Amen.